Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live event. My name is Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator here at Tripwire, and our presenters today are Jane Holt-Lute and Rod Murchison. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. First, um, it seems rather obvious, but we want to make sure you have your volume turned up on your computer so you uh, don't miss a thing. Secondly, if you have questions during the presentation, you may submit them at any time in the questions tab. Jane will be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'd also appreciate any feedback. Um, it's valuable to us, so please use the ratings tab for uh, rating and any comments. During the webcast, also, there will be a couple of polls, so be on the lookout for those and join in. And lastly, I will be sending out a link of the recorded webcast uh, following this event, so you can have that to listen to later and pass along. So now I'd like to introduce Rod Murchison, our co-presenter today. Rod has been a security strategist and technology leader in the industry for <coughs> excuse me, nearly 20 years at such companies as Boeing, Juniper Networks, and Blue Coat Systems, and now we have him at Tripwire. So here's Rod to get the presentation started, and now take it away, Rod. Uh, thank you, Kate, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining in today. My name is Rod Murchison, and I'm the Vice President of Product Management and Technology Alliances for Tripwire. Uh, very interested in our thoughts from the speaker today. Jane Holt-Lute served as the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security from 2009 to 2013. After having been confirmed by the U.S. Senate, uh, Jane has been a well-regarded as an expert in cybersecurity matters, ranging from core technology implementation of best practices and policy recommendations for public and private sector organizations. Now, this is this is great uh, for our attendees today because we're going to have a wide range of attendees from non-technical, more on the policy side, all the way through to deep technical knowledge. And uh, Jane, uh, her qualifications and capabilities certainly spans that entire spectrum. Uh, so, Jane, thank you so much for your years of service and for joining us today. In April, uh, you just announced that, uh, your departure from DHS, uh, and you've been preparing to step into the role of CEO and President at uh, the Council on Cybersecurity. So, congratulations are in order. Uh, your transition is now official since August 11th, I believe, and uh, I'll know, you know that you'll tell us a lot more about uh, your new organization later. Um, but as you were leaving your tenure at DHS, perhaps you could share your observations, what leads you to believe uh, as well that we're in the midst of a global cyber awakening. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Jane, and, uh, and thank you again for your time today. Rod, uh, thanks so much, and, and thanks to all the folks at Tripwire, uh, beginning with Jim Johnson, who is a colleague, friend, and supporter of everything we're trying to do here at the Council. Uh, to you, Rod, and to Catherine of Brocklehurst and to Kate, uh, who opened us up. Thanks for all your help and support in pulling this together. Everyone who's participating on this uh, webinar today and uh, or demonstrating, I guess, in their, their, through their interest in this topic, I think it's fair to say that they're pioneers um, in what I believe will be some of the most important and constructive work that we can undertake to help ensure a fundamental goal of a safe open and secure internet. So in many ways, this conversation is a statement. Uh, it's a statement that the technical and non-technical policy and executive communities have to come closer together to help ensure more effective cybersecurity, to preserve uh, the openness of the internet. But up until this point, joint engagement has really been episodic, individualized, and not really accumulated in any real way, and this has to change. So as the non-technical community of executives and decision makers are becoming more aware of the challenges posed in cyberspace, they're, they're becoming increasingly active. And while also still very reliant on the technical community, this community of non-technical experts are going to become increasingly inquisitive and some might say intrusive in demanding clear results and clearer explanations for cybersecurity. So enormous pressure is building on everyone in cyberspace, and it's pressure born of what I call a global cyber awakening. And what I mean by that is that over the past five years or so, we've all watched as people have come to understand the power of the Internet. Roughly 100 new connections to the Internet are made every minute, expanding an ecosystem in which billions of users, humans and machines, are engaged in trillions of transactions every day a phenomenon of scale and speed really more suited to scientists and policymakers. 
nearly 80% of the population of North America, 70% of Australia, 65% in Europe, and nearly 45% in Central and South America can access cyberspace. And in fact, by one account, the Internet's penetration of the global population is almost 35%. Now, we can all feel this. Uh, more than 1 billion people around the world have joined Facebook in less than 10 years since it was founded in 2004. Yahoo's not far behind. Only the population of two countries on the planet, China and India, can claim those numbers. And frankly, neither one of those states knows its citizens at the level of detail that these Internet companies know their users. So now we're operating with the speed of light and relative ease across geographic, cultural, social, economic, and generational divides. And cyberspace has brought the empowering combination of information and connection to billions of people. And this, in my view, is the cyber awakening. So for a population that's already healthier, wealthier, more educated, aware, and more mobile than at any previous in history, the implications of this empowerment and this awakening, in my view, can hardly be overstated. And I think three observations, at least, are, are to me worth noting. First, while we've come to learn a lot about people as they access the Internet, our understanding of people is almost entirely as consumers and not as citizens. Citizens, for example, typically in, in this country certainly demand security. But as consumers in cyberspace, so far we don't. Second, I would say that when it comes to cybersecurity, the law, the rule of law, the law, has proven as yet to be neither guide nor guardian. We, we all know that the real strength of law lies in its ability to anticipate the familiar and rationalize the unprecedented. But in almost every dimension of the cyber experience, from data to property to exchange to value to rights, while lots feel like it ought to be familiar, lots more is really brand new and the law is not keeping up. The law is always a lagging indicator of social consensus, but it's particularly behind the curve in cyberspace and not keeping up with technology, society, or policy. And what's filling the void? Power and practice. Thus, when it comes to cybersecurity, it's really every, as someone said, it's really every mandiant for themselves. The third observation I would make is that legitimate commercial actors have become powerful in cyberspace largely because they've harnessed the magic of data liquidity. So let's talk about data liquidity and why it's translating into power in cyberspace. Who are the most powerful actors, um, and why is data liquidity important? Data liquidity is like capital liquidity. It's getting information, data, but information where it needs to be, when it needs to be there, nearly instantaneously. And when we think about the most powerful actors in cyberspace, some of the names are up here. Um, we all know them. What makes them the most powerful? Is it armies? No. Aircraft carriers, advanced weapons, air systems, aircraft, no. In our world, the most powerful actors are generally seen to be government, in part because they control armies and aircraft carriers and things like that. But in cyberspace, the most powerful actors are not governments. In fact, for most people, when you tick off on, on using the fingers on your hand, who are the most powerful actors in cyberspace, you run out of fingers before you get to governments. So what really is the role of government in cyberspace and given this cyber awakening? Every citizen understands the importance of security. Um, and in fact, societies typically so assign the responsibility for security to their governments. We want safe streets. So governments, you run the police, you make the laws. We want a safe country. Governments, you run the military, you make the treaties. But when it comes to security in cyberspace, no such assignment has been given to governments. And in fact, seriously, Divergent views exist regarding the role that government should play in cyberspace, and very likely the very familiar roles that they play in the physical world will not translate simply into the ether. On the other hand, governments cannot and frankly are not simply sitting on the sidelines. The potential for truly, for truly dangerous things to happen is really too great. So over the past four years, the Obama administration has been working to raise awareness and strengthening the practice of cybersecurity in many ways. Uh, we, d we were responsible for a lot of this when I was at Homeland Security, um, securing.gov by fielding Einstein, uh, promoting best practices, uh, continuous diagnostics and monitoring, I know we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, pioneering advances in DNSSEC, a, a number of things, uh, not only in the Department of Homeland Security, 
but in other departments across government, um, partnering with relevant parts of the private sector to identify and prioritize promising approaches and steps to greater cybersecurity. Uh, the executive order that the President signed early this year has been well underway. NIST has been hosting a number of collaborations with the private sector um, to uh, identify and inform best practices for the cybersecurity framework that is on offer. And that's just the way in which this government is beginning to move more seriously uh, into cyberspace and into cybersecurity. But, but does our government, does any government for that matter, really have the power that matters? And when we talk about power in cyberspace, what is the power that matters? Um, I talked earlier about the global cyber awakening where connection and information is available to billions of us on the planet and billions more in the offing. Governments um, are late to this game, relatively speaking, in some people's eyes. So is it the power to connect and not the power to protect that matters in cyberspace? Um, if that's true, how should we understand our vulnerabilities and the threats to those vulnerabilities, the threats uh, that we all know from hostile activists, criminals, spies, and others? In fact, criminal and other, other bad actors have become powerful in cyberspace, largely it seems because most of us are willing to trade convenience and connection for safety and protection when we're online. It's a false choice, of course, but it is a choice that has led in part to some bad habits all around. I think, though, it's, it's too glib to explain away our cybersecurity challenges and problems as simply a matter of bad habits. As we all know well, um, the problem of cybersecurity has become one of the most important and fundamental issues facing many of us because we live so much of our lives online. In fact, our national security, uh, our economy, our way of life uh, depends on an open and secure Internet. But we're also at an important inflection point in this field, it seems to me. So more so now than at any other point in the past few decades, it seems to me that we've had access to an extraordinary array of tools, technology, standards, training, classes, you name it. There are certifications, vulnerability databases, configuration, guidance, best practices, catalogs, countless checklists, benchmarks, and recommendations. And now I'm not a technologist, um, but, but we all have seen the explosion in threat information feeds, reports, and tools, and so much of the cybersecurity services on offering now focus on threats, alert services, standards, and, and information sharing schemes with surra surrounding threats. Uh, so we're also surrounded increasingly by an array of security requirements, <clears throat> excuse me, risk management frameworks, compliance regimes, et cetera and all of the things that certainly the community on this call uh, know better than I do. Um, but it seems that notwithstanding all of this information and all of this technology and in the increasing efforts at oversight, the problems in cyberspace and the problems with respect to cybersecurity seem to be getting worse faster than we're getting better. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but, but many people do think that that's the case. So when we're, when we're looking at cybersecurity, who exactly is responsible for what? When it comes to cybersecurity, who has the responsibility to keep us secure? So how do we put our collective knowledge together to establish priorities for action, support each other, and keep our knowledge and technology current in the face of a rapidly evolving problem? What are the most critical problems that need solving? Um, what should an enterprise, an organization, or a user do first? What defensive steps have the greatest value, and how can we find and team up with people that we can trust to lower the signal-to-noise ratio and provide clear, actionable advice when it comes to cybersecurity? Well, these are the kinds of questions that have driven the development and the evolution of the top, the top 20 critical security controls. And so going forward at this moment of inflection, um, what really can we learn from the technical community as the non-technical community uh, which in part I represent, comes into this space with greater awareness, a greater energy, and in fact, greater urgency for action. So this, the technical community, um, the threat analysts, the vulnerability finder, the technology security designers, and all of them have focused on the important problems and what to do about them. 
they're continuing to support each other. There are increasing information sharing schemes, use cases, tools, and other information. The scope of what the technical community has done is really impressive, but it has not in, in all cases translated or trans, been transmitted over into understanding into the executive and non-expert community. And in fact, a lot of what the technical community has done is really pretty basic. Um, working together, collaborating across boundaries, sharing information, um, isn't that what everybody's already saying and doing? Uh, and in part, that's what the, the critical controls are all about, which is practice, changing what we do, not just what we say. So now what we have in the technical community, knowledge, understanding, uh, and tools to, to have greater effect in cybersecurity. But for those of us, again, who are not expert, we're really struggling with what my colleague uh, Tony Sager calls the fog of more. We've got, again, more standards, more ideas, more threat pictures, more analysis, more information, more cases. But to the non-technical user, you're really asking yourself some very simple questions. What do we do first to reduce our vulnerability and to ensure greater cyber security uh, for ourselves? Um, and coming back to this notion of a global cyber awakening, uh, I think it's fair to say that not just uh, executives or high-level policymakers and decision makers in governments are wondering how do we sort through this thicket of information, this fog of more uh, that's out there. How do we understand um, on a, in a replicable way so we can repeat what we know works and avoid repeating failure? How do we sort through it at the level of a user, at the level of a small business uh, enterprise, for example, or at at the level of larger enterprises, perhaps with, with a global footprint, uh, small presences in many countries around the world. How do we reconcile continuing to deliver the goods and services that we want to deliver as business people or as members of government services, uh, for example? How do we do it while ensuring that our information is secure but accessible to the right people to deliver those goods and services? And how do we also do it, people are increasingly concerned, in ways where we're protecting people's privacy, their civil rights, uh, and civil liberties. Well, let's try and cut through some of this. I mean, it's pretty clear that in our complex, interconnected world, no enterprise can afford to think of security as a standalone problem. Uh, not even large, powerful enterprises like some of the big multinational corporations or even the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, the United States government, or the largest best funded international corporations can isolate themselves from or buy their way out of this problem. We're all at some level on the same network. Good guys, bad guys, governments, corporations, not-for-profits, academia, individuals. I mean, the real challenge is to achieve security while maintaining the openness of the internet. And it's Fascinating at one, some level, um, a really interesting set of uh, intellectual and practical problems, but it's also consequential, one we have to take on as a community. So part of what we uh, have been working for, working on here as we've stood up the council is trying to cut through this fog of more and work through identifying priorities for action and practice. So the council on Cybersecurity. Actually, yes, Rod. Jane, sorry, sorry for jumping in on you there. I, I just had a question. Just, you know, as far as taking leadership and making investments, can you speak in maybe a little more detail about DHS? You know, what has gone on? I know, you know, John Stoyford's work has been critical. This sounds like there's some pretty big investments that are going on right now. Can you just kind of go through that in a little more detail? Well, um, you're you're exactly right. In fact. Um, the Department of Homeland Security, when we were uh, standing up the department uh, right after 9-11, uh, worked very quickly to pull together 22 agencies across the federal government and focus on preventing terrorism and responding to natural disasters and preserving, uh, uh, securing the border of this country. Um, and when the Obama administration came in, we were ta tasked by Congress to write the first ever quadrennial Homeland Security Review. 
I'm giving you some of this background um, to help you understand where cybersecurity comes in when, when speaking, uh, when Homeland Security is speaking about it. And so when we were writing the first ever Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, we said, well, what's the point of this thing we call Homeland Security? And we said, well, the point is to help create a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive. A safe, secure, resilient place where our way of life can thrive. And if we're going to do that, we need to do five things and five things well as a federal partner in this enterprise we call the American homeland. And those things we have to do are to prevent terrorism in the first instance. It's job one. Uh, yesterday's anniversary of 9-11 is all the reminder any of us need that it's still an important job, not only for this department, but for all of us to stay vigilant and aware. The second thing we, we said we had to do was secure our borders. Third, uh, enforce and administer our immigration laws. Fourth, uh, build national resilience in the face of disasters uh, so that communities, municipalities, states, towns uh, across this country can respond uh, and bounce back um, when a crisis strikes. And fifth, uh, we called out for the first time for the federal government the mission of ensuring the nation's cybersecurity, and more specifically, a focus on the cybersecurity of the nation's critical infrastructure. So these five missions uh, were called out as the top-level responsibilities of the Department of Homeland Security, and squarely among them uh, is the mission of cybersecurity. So as we, we looked at our responsibilities, we said, well, our job is to secure .gov, uh, the non-military portion of .gov, um, and working to prevent uh, intrusions and increase uh, reduce the vulnerability uh, of the federal profile in cyberspace and in increase security. And we need to respond rapidly uh, when incidents do occur, sharing information, providing uh, technical expertise and responsiveness um, to, to set things right again uh, in the wake of, of uh, effective um, cyber attacks if they were to occur in the federal space. Working together, obviously, with our other federal partners in the Department of Defense and the FBI and across the federal government. And, and we also have a, and have a responsibility for working with the private sector in .com. And here, our highest priority is securing the nation's critical um, infrastructure. And continuous diagnostics and mitigation was really designed to move beyond uh, the paper-based reporting in FISMA, and many, uh, if not all, of the participants on this call will know uh, the Federal Information Security Management Act uh, and its requirements for paper-based reporting of compliance uh, with cybersecurity standards. What continuous diagnostics and mitigation and what John Stroyford had demonstrated in the State Department uh, Veterans Affairs as well, um, and he brought to Homeland Security, and now we, and now the department has just uh, put out uh, a major let um, for a, a six billion dollar five year program to establish tools and services, uh, and making that available to state and local authorities as well. Um, it's really s simply to automate uh, the network sensor capacity. Uh, automating sensor collections, prioritizing risk alerts, uh, diagnosing systems automatically within 72 hours for known cyber flaws, and then instituting a patch uh, process um, that corrects them and, and issues an authority to operate on a continuous basis. Uh, that's, that's what that's designed to do. It's a major leap forward for cybersecurity uh, for the country. Um, and, and, you know, obviously the work is just beginning. Uh, as that contract has been announced, but um, it's a major step forward. It, it certainly is a major step forward. It, it kind of, in a way, it begs the question as to what the interplay will be like between all those, you know, wonderful and very forward-looking initiatives and also the, the side effect or the impact in the corporate world. So we look at, you know, our access to information and how, you know, in, in our company and many others, we've got employees with, Every single, <laughs> every single kind of uh, handset, uh, smartphone, tablet you can imagine accessing information and just piling on more and more and more communications. In this environment, how do we walk that fine line between protection and effective use and privacy? Uh, how, do you, how do you see that playing out? 
you know, that's a, that's a really central set of questions to this whole uh, inflection, uh, that, you know, I think relevant for this whole inflection point that we're at. Um, as more of us have come online, more of us have become aware of both the power of the Internet uh, and our own vulnerability. Um, we're, we're connected constantly, whether we're at home or at the office, uh, and we want that constant connection. Uh, we want more information that we can customize to our own interests and needs. Uh, we want to be available for those uh, relationships and um, activities uh, that we choose and prioritize in our own lives. And so for a long time, people have, uh, I think, drawn very blurred lines between their their working life and their private life and the introduction of private mobile devices into the workplace um, is is really just the latest illustration of that. It's something that's been intensifying uh, over the past, you know, two decades. So, how how do we balance uh, this? If you're uh, running a small business, um, what are your policies regarding uh, attaching personal devices to the networks that operate uh, your business? Um, do you have policies at all? Are you aware that people are doing it? Because in, in fact, of course, they are. Uh, I had a colleague uh, say to me the other day, we were in a room full of people, he said, we're, we all represent cyber risk to each other, um, and this is unacceptable. And I said, well, you know, for a long time, we've all represented the risk of the common cold to each other, um, and that's not, un that's not unacceptable. We've managed to, to cope with standards of behavior and things that we do uh, in the physical world that can, in part, translate into the cyber world as well. So we just don't do certain things when we're in public space, or we shouldn't do them anyway if you've been raised properly, right? If you don't cough into other people's faces. You don't share uh, personal um, uh, you know, combs and brushes and things like that. And, and you take other steps. Uh, and if you're sick, you stay home. Um, so uh, at, a, at some very fundamental level, it's an awareness of the reality in which people lead their lives and work in the workplace. Uh, and instituting policies and technology um, into, the, into the workplace that address some of these concerns. Not perfect answers, it's going to be an ongoing challenge, um, just like the dynamic management of a workforce is an ongoing challenge. But it's one I think we're up to. Absolutely, and it sounds like we, we do have some guidelines and frameworks that we can rely on, certainly in the corporate world and in you know, public and private sector. Can you maybe talk a little bit more of the, the impact of, of SANS, the, the, the 20 CSC, critical security controls, um, BISMA, NIST, ISO, there, there's so many. How, how, uh, how do I, as an administrator potentially, or a CISO in my company, look at these suggestions, these frameworks, these guidelines, and choose what to apply, choose what to, to follow? Um, it's tremendous work, and it's, it's uh, I, I think, very influential to, to a company or to an organization, but sometimes a little bit hard to decide what to do next. Well, it, it, and if you're a not a technical expert, it's impossible to know what to do next. I mean, you turn to your nearest CIO or CSO, CRO, CTO. Uh, we've got a proliferation of CXOs in this space. But this is in part what motivated the establishment of the Council on Cybersecurity is, again, trying to cut through a little bit this fog of more to join together the technology community, uh, the experts in industry, with the non-technical policymakers and executives in the C-suite uh, and say, we can do better here. Um, and so the way we're approaching this um, is really pivoting around the central set of questions, Rob, that you just asked. And we look at uh, the Internet, we look at cyberspace and, and cybersecurity, in fact, as an ecosystem. Uh, and that ecosystem has technology, manpower, and policy. Um, and so the Council, as an independent, expert, not-for-profit organization, it has a global scope. If people want to go onto our website, uh, councilonsybersecurity.org, uh, they'll see our advisory board is draws from members uh, with, with international backgrounds, uh, non-Americans. But we're all committed to a secure and open Internet. And our, our main focus is to accelerate the widespread availability and adoption of effective cybersecurity measures and practice. 
um, highlighting the importance of the entire ecosystem, technology, workforce, and policy to achieve and sustain security. So specifically, uh, we're committed to the ongoing development and widespread ado adoption of the 20 critical security controls. Uh, that for us is key. Uh, SAMS has been an important partner uh, in the incubation and stewardship of the controls. They will be a partner with us, as Tripwire has been a partner with us uh, going forward. Uh, and we think that that work is immediately uh, important. Uh, for example, um, the Australians have just conducted a, a test, a closed test, uh, but one that with nevertheless persuasive results, uh, 1,700 out of 1,700 uh, intrusions were prevented uh, with the implementation of just the top four of the 20 critical controls. That's powerful. That's a powerful illustration of what we can all do right now on the technology front. Um, are you application whitelisting, uh, continuous monitoring and diagnostics, as we talked about before. There are things we can do right now to get the machines in the game and to get the cybersecurity services uh, and tools that you already own, that you already have contracted for, working more effectively to protect your networks. But we're also at the Council focusing on, and you touched on this briefly, uh, the whole question of manpower and the cybersecurity workforce. If you have the latest bright, shiny widget, uh, but you don't know it, you really don't have the workforce skilled in the operation or the maintenance or the updating or the, the full power use of that widget, um, it's a waste of money. We have a lot of people who are in cybersecurity uh, right now. You know, we have a lot of people who fly on airplanes. Not everybody who flies on an airplane is a pilot. <laughs> Not everybody who is in cybersecurity is the, the cybersecurity equivalent of a pilot. Um, and we really need to understand how to sort through the frequent flyers uh, from the pilots. I'm, I'm a frequent flyer. Maybe I'm not even a, a frequent flyer in cybersecurity. I'm certainly not a technologist or an expert in that regard. I would never uh, presume um, to present myself as the kind of cybersecurity expert uh, that has the technical expertise like some of our colleagues, uh, Tony Sager, uh, Alan Paller, John Pescatore, um, and others, um, Mike Asante. Uh, these, are, these are real serious pilots in cyberspace. Um, but overall, many enterprises have, have a workforce in cybersecurity uh, that re whose skills really need uh, strengthening at this moment in time. And the non-technical experts, again, at the executive and policy-making level, need a way to understand how qualified their workforce or these people that they are turning to, their CIOs or CTOs or whatever, we need a way of understanding how qualified you are to do what it is we're asking you to do. And we really don't have a way of doing that right now. So, yeah. you know, for example, you wouldn't have an operation without you know, researching your doctor or researching the hospital uh, and knowing uh, where they stand and a benchmark against their peers in terms of how many times have you done this operation, how, you know, what's the, what's the mortality rate at that hospital. And similarly, we need uh, the same kind of understanding for our cybersecurity professionals. So regarding the cybersecurity professionals, you know, one thing that we certainly notice as a, as a vendor in this space is uh, we repeatedly get asked for making our products simpler, easier to use, you know, much lower in overall, you know, operational cost and maintenance because they simply have a shortage in, in professionals in this area. It's become more and more and more complex. The vendor diversity is high. You know, what can we do to an, encourage new skilled professionals and kind of get our get, get our, our ranks uh, increased here and and get more people? that can, can truly fly the plane, so to speak. Right. I, I think that's, you know, that is at the heart of the manpower question on cybersecurity and this profession. If it is going to be a profession, it needs to professionalize. I, I guess I would make two observations in, in thinking about a response. Number one, technology and human beings have a funny relationship. Uh, in, under, in certain cases, uh, as technology gets more sophisticated, more responsibility is delegated to us so when, as individuals and individual users. So when you think about, for example, the introduction of the telephone 100 or so years ago, um, 
compared to today's phones that was not a particularly sophisticated device. Um, as it uh, became more sophisticated and as more users got telephones in their homes, uh, there's one perhaps apocryphal story about a, a telecom executive saying we can't possibly put telephones in everyone's house. That would require everyone to learn how to become a telephone operator. Well, I mean, that person would be shocked today um, because not only are we all telephone operators, we can all manipulate our phones uh, with, with one hand um, and, and send signals, messages, pictures, and music uh, all the, you know, around the world uh, in an instant. So on, on the one hand, technology evolves in greater complexity um, and more responsibility for using it devolves to individuals. On the other hand, sometimes technology evolves, as, like with our cars, and less responsibility devolves to users. So I don't, I'm not sure about you, Rod, but you know there used to be a time when you could you could open the hood of your car, and I actually knew my way around it a little bit. You know, you could, you know, uh, do a, a few things to tune it up and keep it running. You didn't need to run to the shop every time the engine light came on. Um, and now cars are so complicated, even our mechanics hook them up to machines uh, to find out right, what's going right. on. Um, it's gotten to the point so, there are components that are barely recognizable at this point. Right. Uh, so right. certain things certainly have changed. So that's an example where technology has gotten more sophisticated and less responsibility has flowed to the user. So what are we looking at here in cyberspace and with respect to cybersecurity? Um, certainly the advances in technology will mean that more of us, this comes back to the question that we talked about earlier, m you know, more responsibility to, will flow to us as individual users. But clearly some of these problems are so complex that as the technology um, that bad guys use and as the technology that we use to protect ourselves evolves to greater degrees of sophistication, um, less responsibility will go to individual users and more responsibility will go to the cyber ninjas. So to answer your question, I think there are two things that we have to do simultaneously. On the one hand, we have to um, ensure that all of all of us have a greater understanding of cybersecurity to the extent we can. So, for example, the Council on Cybersecurity is inheriting the work and is the successor organization uh, to NBISE, the National Board of Information Security Examiners, which will be known to some of you on this call. Um, in that work, led by Mike Asante, um, we worked with the Department of Energy to examine what cyber skills should electrical engineers operating the nation's grid, what cyber security skills should those electrical engineers have baked in to their competencies and qualifications as engineers capable of operating the modern grid? And what set of cybersecurity skills should we leave to the specialist community of cybersecurity? So on the one hand, we want to deepen the knowledge within existing professions, electrical engineers, gas and oil, law enforcement, healthcare. What additional cybersecurity knowledge and expertise do you need to have as part of your day-to-day -day job? And which parts of the problem will we leave to the mechanics, to the high-end experts uh, in the Council on Cybersecurity? Um, that will not solve our numbers problem, uh, which you rightly point out, Rod, is, is, is a challenge. We need more highly qualified cybersecurity specialists. So one of the other things that the Council has done uh, is we have become home uh, to the U.S. Cyber Challenge under the leadership of Karen Evans. Uh, this is a program well known to many uh, that works with the cybersecurity community to motivate students and professionals to pursue education, development, and career opportunities in cybersecurity, and we're lo looking to expand our work here. Um, we're also going to, the Council will uh, benchmark the existing cybersecurity programs and degree granting uh, programs of accredited universities uh, and colleges in this country. Um, you know, there are thousands of them, um, uh, thousands of, of colleges and universities in this country. Uh, there are only between six and 700 cybersecurity degree granting or certificate granting programs uh, in the country. How good are they? Uh, many universities are very highly regarded. Are there cybersecurity um, programs? Should they be equally highly regarded? Or um, 
or, or are they lacking in important ways? Uh, which are the very best cybersecurity degree and certificate granting programs uh, in the country? Uh, insiders know, for example, that the University of Tulsa has one of the very best. What is it about that program uh, that makes it so good, that makes its graduates in such demand? Um, we're, again, as an independent expert and authoritative body, going to take a look at that question and put that news out. Uh, we welcome sponsors for that work. Uh, we're not selling anything except uh, best practice and deeper knowledge. Uh, but the workforce uh, challenge is uh, a real one. And uh, equally, um, so is, is the management and the, the promotion of the controls. So the Council has assumed responsibility with leading the ongoing effort to continue to evolve the 20 security controls. Um, and move, we, we believe that, that putting the controls in a, in a not-for-profit home uh, opens up growth opportunities uh, for their adoption and expansion, for example, by easing uh, adoption for, for governments and for other organizations. Uh, Tony Sager, uh, known to many of you, uh, serves as our Director of Programs here at the Council, uh, and he will chair a standing panel for the controls overall, uh, with sub-panels being organized on a needs basis uh, for specific tasks. So uh, let me just ask listeners to look for more information shortly, um, and we'll announce, as we announce the process for nominations to Tony's standing panel. Um, but our aim really is to help all of those with a stake in cybersecurity, buyers, suppliers, and users, uh, make informed, uh, more informed choices on, on priorities in, in cyberspace. Um, it's, it's not really just an exercise in creating top ten lists or, or checklists. Um, we are an, uh, an activist organization. We've already been out there uh, talking to groups. Um, gathering the right ideas, and really speaking, uh, orienting in this first phase um, using the knowledge that the technologists, who are some of the very best in the country, have, uh, and bringing them to non-technologist executive and policy makers um, to help them understand uh, clearly, uh, and in a non-proprietary way, um, what they should do first. Uh, we're going to publish advice for corporate directors um, to help these key decision makers, most of whom, frankly, we know are not technologists or cyber experts. What should a corporate director understand and do right now? What are the myths uh, that we should dispel? Um, and what are the problems that they actually really do have uh, but probably don't know it? Um, we're also, as I mentioned, um, going to do the first ever benchmark study of accredited university and college cybersecurity certificate and degree granting programs. Uh, and our aim is to help people know which of these programs are producing graduates that are most able to deal with today's challenges. Um, we're active, uh, uh, cheer actively cheerleading the U.S. Cyber Challenge uh, to promote the engagement of, of young people. And Karen Evans, a dynamic and capable leader, uh, is is spearheading uh, that effort. Um, as we regularize the stewardship of the controls under, under Tony's leadership, uh, we're going to continue the work, obviously, to avoid, uh, evolve them uh, and strengthen their, their utility as the most important steps to take first. We'll update them once a year uh, based on actual threat information. Uh, we will build the case library, um, and we would love to be pointed uh, to great case use studies. I know Tripwire has an inventory of of some. Uh, others do as well. Uh, we want to build that case library of successes based on uh, early adopters' experience. And um, I'm really focused uh, in particular on encouraging top-level leaders and major organizations and countries to adopt them. Uh, so we're going to work vigorously to break down barriers that have prevented wider adoption of best practice uh, and bring hold home stakeholders together from across the ecosystem, providing an authoritative voice in key practice areas that's independent, authoritative, uh, and international. This is a, I've got to tell you, this is a, a phenomenal initiative you've embarked on. Uh, incredibly valuable, and uh, yeah, the, the, you've got an excellent starting list, of the, a lot on your plate. Um, we've got about 15 minutes to go where we're going to go into our Q&A phase here and also um, jump into some polls that we have online. Um, I believe that we're going to Kate, if you want to launch that poll, so you'll, you'll see this pop up. But um, so when you, when you get a chance, please answer the uh, the poll question. But I, I guess uh, you know a few questions to, to start. 
you know, this is a, a great list of things that, that, you're, that you've embarked on here with the Council on Cybersecurity. What would you say are your, your biggest challenges that you're facing at this point? And, you know, where do you need help, adoption, visibility? What, what can we do to, to further this right. effort? I would say the biggest challenge is that the non-expert community does not uh, really know how to make sense of all of the fog of more in cybersecurity. They really just want to know, what do you want me to do first? Um, and can you demonstrate to me that this effectively solves or deals with my cybersecurity problem or reduces my vulnerability um, in ways that uh, you know, we can live with, because we will have to all live with some risk. Uh, the question is, how do we reduce that risk uh, to the greatest possible level? So the biggest challenge we have right now is looking at non-expert, uh, talking with non-experts uh, who are at the heads of these organizations, who are on these corporate boards, who are the CFOs, who are the COOs. Um, how do I make sense of what my technologists, uh, my IT specialists, my cyber uh, specialists are telling me uh, I should do first. And so the biggest challenge right now uh, is no longer um, convincing them that they've got cyber security as something they need to pay attention to and worry about. That that has changed. They, they are now aware, uh, increasingly worried. Um, but as I said earlier when we first began, they're also not known as a, as a community of people uh, who stand still. Uh, they act on what they know. Um, and, and they will want to, they want to know what they should do first. Yeah, yeah, prioritization is certainly key. It's it's something that uh, you know on, on the tripwire side we've we've really been looking at a lot, and we've had uh, some some themes that we've put in uh, in, in our own development efforts. We call uh, connecting security to the business or connecting security to the mission. Right. It's it's taking this you know very very detailed. In some cases, very hard to understand security information that we have in front of us. You know, how do we take that and truly prioritize it from a mission perspective or a business perspective? I think there's components to visualization that we need to think about. It's components to just messaging. How do we talk about you know these these issues? Um, right. do, do, you, do you see that as you know a, a bit of a missing link potentially that we that we need to so, deal with from a vendor perspective? Um. Well, what I would certainly, never having been a vendor, what I would say from a policymaker, um, a policymaking perspective, having been at senior levels of, of my own government and, and in the United Nations with also responsibility for cybersecurity, for peace operations worldwide, among other things, you have to reconcile exactly as you say, Rod, sort of, sort of the imperatives of three processes that are going on at any one time in an organization. Um, the first set of processes is, is the operational process or the mission process. You know, what are we selling or what are we doing? What, you know, what services are we providing? The second set of processes are the business processes, the human resource processes, the acquisition and procurement processes, the logistics and supply processes that support the mission and operational work. And the third is that whole set of audit and oversight processes to which all of us um, are increasingly attentive. And these three processes place different demands on the information in your organization, on the flow of that information, on the accessibility and reliability of that flow, on data liquidity. And so the cybersecurity framework uh, has to take account of all three, but they have different needs. So it's exactly what you say. Well, thank you. All right. Now, I'd like to let everyone know that we do have a, you know, the ability to take questions online. We've got some queuing up right now, and uh, we'll start walking through those. Uh, I would say that, let's see, the first question we've got here, um, it's a question about the, the velocity of attacks. It, it, the, the question here is that it just seems like we can't, as an industry, get ahead of it. It's speeding up. It's getting more complex. It's I think analogous to opening up the hood of your car and looking and just saying, wow, I, I can't make heads or tails of this, but the, the threat seems to be increasing. Do you see the same thing? Are we in, you know, is it accelerating? Have we gotten to any point of, of containment and getting kind of over the hump on this? Um, or are we, are we just not even keeping up and falling behind? 
Um, this is a really, really interesting question. Are we worse off or not? Um, are things really getting as bad as we think they are? Um, there are very serious people who say, you know, the answer is it's not any, we're not really any worse off. Uh, I had a conversation with John Pescatore uh, a few days ago, and John said, look, the sine wave of cybersecurity threat and, and threat capability uh, goes up and down, and the sine wave of cybersecurity protection and defense goes up and down. And at times, the, the, you know, the, the curve of each um, is furthest apart from each other, and at times, they're pretty close together. So, but when you even it out over time, um, things are, are probably within a, a bandwidth roughly to where they were at some point, uh, you know, in the not too distant past. And my response to that was that may be true for the overall marketplace, John, but for the individual firm, the individual enterprise, it is surely worse. Uh, I talked to the head of a major, uh, excuse me, international corporation the other day, does business globally, um, and they have, they suffer about, a thousand attacks a day. Um, he was guessing. He really didn't know, but he, he thought it was a big number. Um, I, I'd, it would be interesting to, to know if the number were really that or ten times that. Um, and for the first time recently this year, uh, they actually had their sites taken down uh, for two hours. Up until that point, uh, they had managed to prevent uh, any serious intrusion uh, from doing any consequential damage. So is the velocity of attacks increasing? I think the answer is yes. Uh, is the density of attack, attacks increasing? Yes. Are, they, are, are threat actors uh, becoming more sophisticated? Um, are the, yes, there's no question about that. So as more and more of us come online, more and more of us are vulnerable until we reach a point where we can really um, push back the curve of attacks and threats uh, with a threshold of cyber hygiene uh, that ensures basic cybersecurity protections, and then we can build more sophisticated tools on top of that. But we're not doing the basics yet by a very long shot. And, and you asked about challenges for the council. One of our challenges is to get the basics in place. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, okay, we've got another. This is actually, I think, a very relevant question. Uh, it's regarding cloud computing and in, the, in our progression into the cloud. The question is, many companies or agencies are moving into cloud computing because of a decision of the quote-unquote non-experts. Who is responsible for cybersecurity in the cloud? <laughs> that's a great question. It is, yeah. that's, ex that's at the heart of the issue right now. So, so ultimately, um, you know, at, you know, in the military, I, I spent the first part of my adult life in the army, um, and there was a saying that you know a commander is responsible for everything your unit does or fails to do. Um, it's a little more complex out here in the civilian world. Um, you know, who, the, obviously those with the fiduciary obligations for the organization, the, the corporate directors, uh, the senior level management, they all have responsibilities for ensuring uh, that not only do your operations continue to run, but that your processes are secure and that we're not compromising or unacceptably using people's private information uh, and, and potentially uh, causing cyber or privacy breaches. Um, we need to narrate, though, more clearly as a society, and this is a conversation I think we have to have, and our laws will eventually reflect that. But as I said, they're lagging. So in the first instance, uh, the leadership of that organization, certainly the corporate directors, uh, need to be informed by the techno technological community, the IT community, the CIO, the CRO, um, and receive assurances that all things are being done. I would begin that set of questions uh, with where are we on the top four of the 20 critical security controls? And, and for the non-technical expert, the, the, the challenge is not the first question you ask, is our network secure? The challenge is questions two, three, four, and five. Okay, if our networks are secure, demonstrate that to me which parts of our network are suffering which kinds of intrusions, what do we know about those intrusions, how often do they occur, how long does it take us from detection to mitigation. I mean, those are questions two, three, four, and five that we need to get the non-expert community more engaged in, whether yes, you're in the yes, cloud yes. or running your own service. 
Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I, you know, I think a, a question that just came in that's very much related to that, and you know, because the, the push to cloud, cloud-oriented services in general is, is largely a cost decision, right? And, and security is certainly commingled. But um, this question is around, you know, pushing decision makers towards adopting security best practices, you know, such as one through four critical controls from SANS. But security doesn't. We, we, very often we hear that security does not add revenue to the bottom line. How do, how do we get people in a different frame of mind around this? You know, whether it's cloud-oriented services or on-prem or your own quote-unquote private cloud, right. how do we turn this around from just yet again another cost through fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and really looking at maybe a SANS 20 CSC in a different light? You know, yes, you go through this process, it's good hygiene, it's the right thing to do. It's not just a sunk cost, it's much more than that. Well, so so a couple of, of, of things are engaged here. One, I think the, the migration to the cloud is not just a function of cost, but it's also a function of what we were talking about earlier, which is when technology gets really very highly sophisticated, less of it is is given to us. You know, we're we're actually able to to interface less directly, and we should really give it over to the experts. But when we say cybersecurity is just another uh, cost, um, that is uh, life in the fast lane. Um, I don't. You don't hear automotive manufacturers say that. Well, seatbelts now are just an added cost. Uh, they're an essential element uh, that people demand now in their automobiles. And when you look at users and with respect to their cars, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's not a bad one. Uh, people say, do I have anti-lock brakes? Do I have airbags? Do I have seatbelts? Uh, do I have um, uh, protective glass uh, on, my, on my car? You know, three or four or five things that every user knows to look for and, in fact, now demand. Um, and... You know, has it been rolled into the price of the car? Uh, perhaps, and that's what the economists would tell us. But we can simply no longer afford a view uh, in business, in industry, by users, expert or not, uh, that it's an extra cost I can't afford. You can't afford not to adopt the 20 critical controls beginning with the top four. You cannot afford not to have sensible policies uh, regarding uh, BYOD, bring your own devices to work. You can't afford not to have an orientation on your cybersecurity workforce that helps them, that invests in them and elevates their level of professionalism uh, to where it needs to be today. Uh, thank you very much. We've got a couple more questions, and actually we have one more quick survey if we have time here. Uh, also around kind of the, the starting point for those who have adopted SANS. Uh, we've got about uh, two and a half minutes left. And uh, let's see, one question is, how would you recommend federal entities become engaged in the recent DHS continuous monitoring program? Well, I, I mean, that pushing on an open door. Um, yes. when, when I left the Department of Homeland Security uh, and, and John Stroyford, again, who, who is a national treasure um, uh, there, I, I, I'm, I'm very proud of him. And he's, he's a tremendous uh, civil servant and asset. Um, uh, federal agencies should, should contact John, should contact the department, uh, should look at the procurement that's been uh, hung online. Um, and, and uh, engage in a way to bring continuous monitoring to their organizations. Um, it is uh, a game changer. Uh, agreed. Uh, okay, and then here's a question that's uh, quite uh, top of mind based on current news events. Uh, what steps is the government doing or taking to make sure that classified information, things like weapons design, very sensitive information, uh, what, what are we doing to make, make sure that it's confidentiality and, and, and uh, basically best practices are, are being uh, followed by defense contractors. So we've got, you know, multiple, multiple components here all interfacing with the sensitive information. You know, what, what are we doing to protect ourselves? Well, um, so I, I see we're running out of time. This is obviously a complex question. Yes. Um, there are, there, the, this country has in, in, information that it needs to be kept classified and protected uh, with all the appropriate protections, uh, technological and otherwise, uh, necessary to preserve that information um, and, and uh, to preserve our national security. But by the same token, uh, the cybersecurity of this country, we, we won't be able to run it like an intel program. We have to distribute responsibility, get everyone engaged in the game, 
um, and distribute responsibilities from users to executives to technologists to companies to cities, uh, states, localities, and the federal government as well. It's a burden we all have to share. Well, Jane, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your time today, as I'm sure all the, uh, the folks who have dialed into this webcast appreciate it as well. Um, and uh, any, any final thoughts or comments you'd like to leave us with today? You know, um, as we, uh, you know, what we're trying to do here with cybersecurity reminds me of, of, you know, what I call the Christopher Columbus rule. Never fail to distinguish what's new from what's new to you. Uh, no single technique, no matter how sophisticated, can do all that needs doing, and all that needs doing can't be done alone. And, and as we're reaching for higher ground here on cybersecurity, we know we're standing on the shoulders of many who have gone on before. And so on behalf of all of us who benefited from what many of the people on this call have, have done and are doing, uh, let me just say thank you. Uh, thank you to Tripwire Rod, and thank you to you. Um, join us at the Council. Uh, we're looking to make use of your expertise. Uh, there'll be invitations and opportunities posted on our website. Uh, but thank you again, Rod, for, for hosting this. All right. Well, well, thanks to you as well, and thanks to, thanks to all our participants. Uh, we had many questions. We tried to get through as many as we could. Uh, if you have uh, any follow-up questions we'd like to, you'd like to have us answer specifically, you can always send them in to us. I believe we have some contact information uh, that was that was sent out. But uh, but once again, Jane, thanks to you, all the work that you've done. We really appreciate it, and uh, I believe that's a wrap. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for joining.